Anthony P. Monaco became the 13th president of Tufts University on August 1, 2011, a distinguished geneticist. He had served as the pro vice chancellor for planning and resources at the University of Oxford since 2007. He is an accomplished leader, scientist, and teacher. He brings to the Tufts presidency deep-rooted commitments to academic excellence, diversity, and inclusion, a global perspective, and the cons consequential role that universities have in society. A native of Wilmington, Delaware, yay tri-state area, <laughs> President Monaco received his undergraduate degree from Princeton University in 1981 and his MD and PhD through Harvard Medical School's Medical Scientist Training Program, where he specialized in the genetics of neurological disorders. His doctoral research led to a landmark scientific discovery, the gene responsible for X-linked Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophies, which weaken the skeletal and heart muscles. Prior to serving as pro vice chancellor at Oxford, Dr. Monaco had directed the university's Welcome Trust Center for Human Genetics since 1998. Under his leadership, the Welcome Trust Center doubled its size. It is now the largest externally funded university-based research center in the UK. He also had been a professor of human genetics at Oxford since 1997, teaching undergraduate and graduate students through laboratory supervision and coursework. He led Oxford's neurogenetics group a team of scientists investigating the genetic underpinnings of neurodevelopmental disorders, including autism, specific language impairment, and dyslexia. His group was the first to identify a gene specifically involved in human speech and language. He was elected to the European Molecular Biology, Biology Organization, EMBO, in 2006, and is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, Great Britain, and the Royal Society of Medicine. President Monaco holds faculty appointments as a professor of biology in the School of Arts and Sciences and as a professor of neuroscience at Tufts University School of Medicine. Since coming to Tufts, President Monaco has led our community in three strategic initiatives, campus sustainability, diversity, and interdisciplinary science and research in critical thematic areas. Please join me in wel welcoming President Tony Monaco. Is there a pointer? Is this, is this, is this my? Yep. Is it pointer on the top? No. Yes. yes. I'm alive. <laughs> you can hear me. Well, thank you very much for that uh, nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for inviting me. I also look forward to um, attending the reception and dinner this evening and the panel discussion. So I was asked to speak to you today about some of my research in the neurosciences. I graduated from Harvard in the program in neuroscience, uh, which was a university-wide program, but also did my medical degree. And it was there that I developed an interest in human genetics when I was involved with the um, isolation of the gene for muscular dystrophy. I then went to England for two years and ended up staying 23 years, but I originally went to work on the Human Genome Project because uh, there was a particular individual I wanted to work with there, and then they offered me the chance to set up my lab in Oxford. And over the last uh, 16 or 17 years in Oxford, I've been working on the genetics of neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, it's not moving. Should I do it with the mouse? Is that the best thing? I don't know why it's not. Yeah, it's not. Sorry. That's all right. I can just use the. So I thought I'd start with just refreshing your. your <laughs> refreshing, boy, this is an exciting conference. <laughs> People are falling over in the aisles. Um, I thought I'd just refresh your memory about uh, sort of how genes make it their way to behavior. Of course, they make RNA. 
and that RNA um, is used in making proteins, but also regulatory RNAs, which feed back on the genes or in other mechanisms to regulate how RNA is made. And then the proteins in cells, and cells as groups uh, make up an organ such as the brain, which then uh, is influencing behavior. And you can see that this slide was made in the UK by the spelling of the word behavior. Um, and all of these processes can be influenced by the environment. Genes are not determinative. They really do interact with the environment, as do proteins and cells. And of course, brains and humans in, f in performing behaviors interact with the environment. Uh, very much. And then underneath that I've tried to place what the different ways of studying these processes are. Genetics looks mostly at the, at the genes themselves. Those that study RNA study transcriptomics. If you're just studying um, the proteins, that, that is the, an area called proteomics. Or if you're studying how the genes work to make a brain, that would be neurodevelopment. Those that look at the brain as a holistic organ, um, many times you're using imaging techniques. And of course, those that are looking at behaviors will be on a, in psychology, psychiatry, and also at a population level in epidemiology. And whatever we study in humans, um, animal models are very important for all these different aspects. And uh, during my talk, I'll mention how we use different animal models in understanding some of the genes we've identified. So my lab for many years has been interested in neurodevelopmental disorders. It was really a marriage of my interest in neuroscience with my knowledge of genetics. And many of these disorders, when I started 15 years ago, really had no um, knowledge outside of the uh, understanding that they may have strong genetic components. And I really want to just walk you through what we've learned, let's say, over the, that time, uh, particularly for autism, language impairment, and dyslexia. The first is that all four of those disorders have very strong um, evidence that the genetic factors are increasing the risk. One of these is based on large twin studies, where you look at the rates of those disorders in monozygotic or identical twins with those that are dizygotic or um, similar to siblings um, for non-identical twins. And you look at the concordance rate of whether one sibling has, one twin has the disorder and whether the co-twin is also affected. And that evidence shows very strong heritability for all four of the neurodevelopmental disorders. Another um, piece of evidence is you can actually find large pedigrees, not so much for autism, but certainly for language impairment and dyslexia. You can find large three-generational pedigrees where you can actually look at the segregation of affected individuals, and I'll show some examples of that during the talk. And then is, in a general level, you can count the amount of um, uh, people that are affected within families and compare that to the population prevalence for a disorder and really show that there is a familial clustering of these disorders in families. Now, families share genes as well as the environment, but that alongside the twin-based studies, which can control for environment, really does signal that the genetic factors increasing risk for neurodevelopmental disorders is quite strong. With that knowledge that genetics is important, uh, what can one do to try to find what we call susceptibility genes? Those are the genes which have mutations or variants which increase your risk along with environmental factors for um, these disorders. And the first area is chromosome abnormalities. These can be physical breaks uh, called translocations, and I'll show you that in a second. Another area is copy number variants, which are small deletions or duplications of material, which change genes or gene regulation. And then you have the more traditional um, ways of looking at pedigrees or families in genetics. That's linkage studies. And then when you look at the gene level and look at the variance in genes, we can use association studies. And I'll give examples of all these different methods. So one of the first areas is translocations. The principle is that if you can identify an individual or several members of a family that have a neurodevelopmental disorder, when you look down the microscope and see their pairs of chromosomes, you can actually see that there's been a physical break between two chromosomes, a reciprocal um, replacement of material. And when that happens, it actually gives you a very specific point on the chromosome where you think you might find a gene involved because that physical breakage of the chromosome may snap a gene in half, uh, 
alter its function. And then if you can get at that gene because of the translocation breakpoint, you may d identify a candidate for the disorder. And many genes have been identified um, even way back when we were working on muscular dystrophy uh, using chromosome translocations. This is a, a newer area, and this came about mostly because of the knowledge of the Human Genome Project. Now that we know the full sequence and have DNA probes all along the chromosomes, one can test for whether there's been a deletion of material. This slide shows a deletion uh, or even a, an addition of material, which you can see in the next slide called a duplication. You can see that that band Q21 has been duplicated, and there you can see it's been deleted. These are usually reciprocal events. Sometimes because of the crossing over between chromosomes, it either deletes material or it adds material if they have unequal crossing over. Now, individually, um, we all have these in our genome. They can, they're just normal variations, but in some areas, they can hit genes and delete materials in genes, which are important and important to the function of the brain and then give you uh, something like autism or language impairment or dyslexia. I'm going to show you in a minute how important these types of copy number variants are in autism, and this is a relatively new finding that's only come out in the last few years. And just to remember that each of us has two pairs of chromosomes, and so the reason it's called a copy number variant because it's changing the normal copy number of two down to one or up to three if it's a duplication. And that's the duplication there. These can also be inherited or they can be de novo. Inherited means that one of your parents would have had it and passed it down to you. De novo means that it, neither of your parents had it in their body tissues, but it must have occurred in one of the germline, the eggs or the sperm, and that deletion or duplication was then given to the child um, and it is not seen in the parents. I'd now like to just go through what we, we found out about autism. It's a very severe neurodevelopmental disorder, originally identified by Leo Kander in 1943, and is really characterized by three impairments in, in three areas, verbal and nonverbal communication. Um, many of the children do not develop language uh, beyond single words or phrases. They have very poor reciprocal social interaction, so if the child is playing with a toy and the mother comes in the room, most normal children will look up, smile at the mother, interact with her, and then go back to the toy. Most children with autism will just ignore the person coming into the room and continue to play with the toy. They don't have that proper social interaction in a reciprocal manner. They also have very repetitive and stereotyped patterns of behavior and interests. They like to play with the same toy every day. Thomas the Tank Engine, you can't take it away from them. They don't like change in their food or their environment. They really do like very um, stereotyped uh, patterns and interests. The onset of autism is usually before three years of age, mostly picked up when the child doesn't develop language properly, and it does persist, persist throughout life and the population prevalence um, is, is quite high. But like all the neurodevelopmental disorders, that is language impairment, dyslexia, and ADHD, the ratio of males to females is all three or four to one. So there's something about neurodevelopmental disorders in males that they're more susceptible or that females have some sort of protective factor. But we know that autism on the severe end is only one end of the spectrum. We now call this autism spectrum disorders. There's a range of, of different um, severities in autism, and other, other types are called Asperger syndrome or the horribly named PDD-NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. And you'll be glad to know that that's been stricken from the DSM-4, and I think in DSM-5, it is now all called autism spectrum disorder. But when you combine the severe forms with the milder forms, the population incidence does approach about 1%. So it's quite a high percentage of um, individuals in the population that have autism spectrum disorders. And in many cases, they have a concurrent epilepsy or other learning difficulties. About 5% of autism cases do have comorbidity, that is, um, they have another Mendelian disorder like Fragile X syndrome or neurofibromatosis or tuberous sclerosis. So it's a f small percentage of those cases of those other monogenic disorders will have autism as part of the phenotype. 
What is the evidence for genetic factors? I talked about twin studies. So if you look at the concordance rate of autism in monozygotic or identical twins to dizygotic twins, it's about 64% to anywhere between 0 and 9%. That provides a very high heritability, although there has been a recent study which is saying that, that estimate, those estimates are inflated, and they thought the um, estimate was much lower in the around 40% that I think needs to be replicated. The rate among siblings, though, is, is fairly low, only about 3 to 9 percent. And that does say something about the fact that there probably isn't a simple Mendelian inheritance, because if it was a dominant disorder, you would expect 50 percent of the children to have autism. If it was a recessive disorder, it would be 25 percent. So the fact that siblings are very low means that there are environmental factors and or many genes involved. But all that said, it's still one of the most strongly genetic of the childhood onset um, psychiatric disorders, but we don't really have a clear mode of inheritance, probably because there's many genes involved. And as I mentioned, both the family and the twin studies do provide evidence of a, what we call a broader autistic phenotype, the milder forms which you may see in the parents or in the siblings of a child with a severe form. And they're usually um, people of normal intelligence who have social interaction problems or other milder related um, uh, communicative disorders. But if you take those into account, you can actually see that the concordance rate in the twin studies then goes up to almost 20% if you take into account the milder forms. When we originally started this work 15 years ago, we thought there was probably a pathway in the brain that was important for development of the brain. And when it was altered, it gave you the phenotype of autism. So we thought that in one patient, we, we had the feeling then that there were many genes involved, that perhaps variants in genes or mutations in genes uh, would interact with each other. So you'd have one patient who had variants in genes A, C, and D, another patient with variants in other genes in the pathway, et cetera. And these variants could be found in normal individuals. So we thought in the beginning we were going to find uh, a gene like C, which was going to be common to all forms of autism, or like E, which was highly frequent. We have found no evidence yet for genes which are, have variants that are common in all forms of autism. What we have found evidence for is that there are rare genes like D or F, is the more um, seen case that you have mutations or variants or copy number variants in genes, but they're individually rare. So basically, hardly any two autistic kids are going to be the same. And this came about by doing genome-wide studies with uh, all the technology that we've developed in the Genome Project and looking for these small deletions and duplications of material. And we could ask several questions in this type of study. Do autistic kids have more? I, I remember I said 12% of our genome is in this category of small deletions and duplications. Um, and so do autistic kids have more overall genome-wide burden of deletions and duplications? The answer is no. When you measure how many they have or their size, they're very similar to other people. But if you look at where they're occurring, they're occurring in genes. So there's a, an increased percentage of where they occur, that they occur in genes rather than the areas between genes. And also, if you look at what those genes encode for, many of them, a 70 percent um, increase in genes that have been implicated in learning difficulties or autism spectrum disorders in other studies. The most important concept, though, is that these CNVs are rare. None of them that we've identified yet has been found to affect more than 1 percent of autism cases. So it means that they're important, and overall they could probably mount up to about 15 or 20 percent of autism cases will have a CNV, but no single CNV is frequent in all autism cases. They can occur de novo, they can occur in an inherited form, there doesn't seem to be much difference. But we also found some evidence that you could have a case of a child who gets one CNV from the mother and another CNV from the father in different genes. So they're getting a multiple hit kind of uh, pattern where you could have uh, two different genes being knocked out um, by these CNVs coming from the mother or the father. The one thing we did find was that many of these genes were important in the connections between brain cells called synapses. 
and we've been following up several of those. So one example here is in the gene cadherin 8, which is kind of a sticky immunoglobulin-like adhesion protein that not this one had never been studied before in the brain, but when we did this type of analysis, you can see the two chromosome 16s in this patient, and the data on the blue line above um, is all the different DNA probes across the chromosome, and you can see that on the right-hand side, the normal two copies, which is here represented by the uh, zero, um, decreases across that section. Now, the middle part uh, doesn't really have um, any probes in it. That's the centromere. It's highly repetitive part of the chromosome, so we don't usually have probes there, but you can pretty clearly see by eye that the area on the right has a small section which has gone from two copies down to one copy, and that's a deletion of material. We could then map that and against all the genes and different DNA probes, and very interesting, you can see that that deletion maps um, here to this area. This is that patient. It's a pretty large deletion. It's, it's like a million base pairs or more. But also someone had, had found, this is a database, had found another deletion uh, in this uh, similar region overlapping with that one with a child with a learning disability, not autism, but more like mental retardation. And the only gene in this region is cadherin 8, and it is in the overlap region of those two deletions. So that's pretty good evidence that cadherin 8 is probably the culprit in these cases. And the outcome could be autism or learning uh, disability. But no one had studied cadherin 8 before, so we um, decided to map it. Oh, no, this thing is not functioning. You can actually make a, I don't know if you've ever heard of the PCR reaction, but it's a way of developing primers on either side of something and developing an assay that you can see on, an, on a gel. And we could do this for the deletion. And you can see here, this is the family. There's three affected children. The deletion is um, here seen as a positive result because we, we're actually assaying for the deletion. And you can see that the mother's a carrier, but she's somehow protected. Three of the, children, three of the males, who are more susceptible anyway, carry the deletion, um, and they all have autism. And then the other males and females in the family, um, their siblings, are not affected, and they do not. So this is what we call perfect segregation with the disorder. And then if you look at cadherin 8 in human fetal brain, it's very highly expressed in here in the cortic, cort, developing cortex. So this is the area in the front of the brain. This is two different isoforms of this gene. And the dark area, the speckly area, shows where the RNA is being produced. And this was never studied before, so it really showed that cadherin 8 is probably important in brain development. And the deletion of this material in these affected children uh, is probably uh, causing their autism. So what we have learned from this study so far is that what we call a genetic term called variable expressivity. What it means is I showed you cadherin 8 deletion in a kid with autism and also a kid with learning disability. We now know that these CNVs are not predeterminate of the type of outcome. So you can have a gene that's deleted, and one family it could cause epilepsy, another family it could cause learning disability, and a third family it could cause autism. So clearly there are other factors involved, either genetic or environmental, and that is a very interesting finding um, from these studies. For example, there's an area on chromosome 1 in the band Q21 when deleted or duplicated can cause autism, bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia. This is not something we would have expected uh, 10 years ago. They can also have variable penetrance. That means not everyone who has the CNV will get the same, that disorder. I think the mother in that previous family showed that is a good example. She carried the deletion, but for some reason she's not got autism. Her three boys have, had, have the deletion, and they get autism. So the penetrance of the effect of the deletion is not 100%. We can also see comorbidity with other disorders. We can have kids with um, Down syndrome who have autism. Duchenne muscular dystrophy kids can have autism. And as I mentioned, things like Fragile X. And I told you before that there is a multiple hit hypothesis that sometimes you get two different CNVs in different genes. This is some of the genes that we think are important at the moment. This kind of jigsaw puzzle is just being put together. But this is the connection between two brain cells. It's called the synapse. 
It's where the neurotransmitter goes across and signals from one neuron to the other. And it seems that these types of molecules, which are important for the development of synapses for making those connections, may be um, in, in defective in autism. Some of the examples are norexin and norligand. We have found mutations and CNVs in both of those in different aspects of the glutamate receptor, including this protein called shank. I mentioned the protocadherins, and you can see cadherin. Um, and then there's other molecules on the right. And one of those I'll mention a little bit later in language development, which is CNTNAP2, which is contactin-associated protein 2, because it, it is associated with contactin. It does seem to have importance in language um, impairment as well. So pictures are starting to develop that the genes that are being disrupted by these CNVs are important in the synapse, but that's not the only area, and there's a lot more work to be done. So some of the future prospects about autism. I mentioned that we never found common variants or variants which were seen in the majority of cases. One question we have is, have we looked at enough cases to, do, to say that really strongly? So there is an interest in trying to get cohorts of like 10,000 or 20,000 autistic kids. Most of the things we've done have been less than 1,000 autistic children. So there is the possibility of getting larger studies which increase power but I don't think they're going to find um, these types of associations. The other area, as you may have noticed uh, in the press, is that the power of sequencing and the cost of sequencing has really changed. You can now sequence uh, someone's DNA for usually less than $5,000. So there is an interest now that although we found lots of deletions and duplications of material, there are probably a lot of point mutations out there, single nucleotide changes in these genes, and the only way you're going to get at them is by sequencing. So there's a large number of projects at the moment which are taking all the cases that we have accumulated internationally and sequencing them to find uh, point mutations, and that'll tell us about the genes and the proteins, and many of them will probably still be in the synapse. The other area is how you translate this um, knowledge into clinical practice. One of the areas is thinking about how these rare CNVs could be used diagnostically uh, in, in part of the workup of kids with autism. And there are methods and platforms where this can be done in health services. It's already done for learning disabilities, and I think in this country has been moved pretty far along to be done for the workup of kids with autism. The benefits are that you could counsel families better if you identified a CNV. It allows the parents to understand a little bit more about why their child has autism. It also has possible um, benefits for early intervention for any siblings. For example, if you have a diagnosis of autism in an older child, they have a deletion or a CNV, you can test one of the younger siblings who may be only one year old to see if they carry the CNV and think that if, if they do, they're at higher risk for autism, and therefore you may want to try early interventions. Some of the possible um, other benefits are that as we learn more about each of these CNVs, it may tell us something about the outcome. For this CNV on chromosome 1, this type of patient is going to develop epilepsy you know, with a higher frequency than others. This type of information would be important to clinicians going forward if they're thinking about treatments. Some of the difficulties are that CNVs are common, so we have to be really sure that the ones we're calling autism-specific truly are, and that requires a lot more data collection. There's also um, potential difficulties when we talk about testing asymptomatic siblings. I gave the example of a younger sibling. Well, that's a kind of an ethical issue because you're then labeling that child as potentially autistic, although the outcome may be that they ha are perfectly normal. And that's something that people are trying to get their heads around in terms of the ethical consequences of testing a child before they have any symptoms, although that knowledge may allow you to have an intervention which improves their outcome. So if I can summarize, autism definitely has a very complex genetic etiology. CNVs, that is small deletions and duplications of genes, are a major class of autism risk and causation, probably seen in about 10 to 15 percent of cases. In both the CNVs and the mutations we find in genes, we really need to be sure what's disease related or causative and what could be something that we all have in our genome called a polymorphism. 
I talked about the association studies and the need to probably increase the, the number of individuals in those studies before we really rule out that these aren't a major risk factor for autism. But the, um, what it is finding is that we need to move on to sequencing genes. We need to do higher resolution CNV studies to be able to find the other 80% you know, of causation of autism that would probably be found at the genetic level. And throughout all these studies, collaboration has been incredibly important. We started with a, a, a study that had about 50 sites working together. We then joined that in with five or six other big collaborative groups to form the Autism Genome Project, and that is a really big project to manage. So collaboration, the only reason we got there in the end was by having clinicians and scientists working together to um, get these big studies done. So I'm now going to move on to specific language impairment. And in that case, uh, I'm going to show you a family uh, that we did linkage studies on to find the gene and also a translocation that was important. So two of the uh, different methods of finding genes will, will be discussed in this case as well. So language impairment is a very interesting disorder because if you stop anyone on the street and ask them what autism is or what dyslexia is, most of them can tell you because they know someone who has it. But language impairment is something that most people don't really understand, although it's very, very frequent. It's just as frequent as dyslexia and more frequent than autism. And it's really a diagnosis of exclusion, where a child has difficulty developing expressive or receptive language skills, and you have to rule out neurologic impairment, sensory problems like deafness, um, and making sure that they have adequate uh, uh, intelligence generally and that this is not just a learning disability uh, that affects all um, different parts of the brain. The comorbidity is very strong with autism because we said autism cases go on to have language impairment and many children with language impairment will go on to have reading or literacy problems like dyslexia. They do have a lot of problems later in life and are at increased risk of psychoses. Again, the genetic factors are very strong. It really does cluster in families. This could be due to genetics or environment, but the twin studies really show that the concordance for speech and language disorders is very, very strong in identical twins and much lower in non-identical twins. And therefore, the heritability for language as a, a trait is almost 100%. We've also used two different methods to approach this to find genes. One is called a quantitative trait loci approach. I'm not going to talk about this at all because I'm going to go on to talk about this very rare family, the KE family, but just to appreciate that there's a difference between a clinical diagnosis of autism, which is based on the phenotype of the patient, whether they have a behavior or not. But in language and reading disorders, one can use standardized tests. You can give them a test which has a mean of 100 and a variance on either side. So you can gain a lot of power in the way you describe the phenotype uh, in genetic studies by taking what we call the proband, who is an individual who's got a severe problem, measuring them on language ability in a standardized test, and then measuring all their siblings. And you can see that this is not clearly uh, they have it or they don't. They're going to have a different point on this curve, and if you use that knowledge, because you could have someone that's a very good um, with language skills, or these children, for example, are actually on the more, um, less uh, well uh, on the ability scale, and that difference between the siblings and the probands can be quite powerful uh, in genetic studies, and that's called a quantitative trait approach. But there are uh, multi-generation pedigrees with severe speech and language disorders. One of them is the famous KE family from London. This is a three-generation pedigree where about 50% of the um, members are affected with a very severe speech and language disorder, and males and females are equally affected. This type of pedigree is what we call an autosomal dominant disorder because uh, basically the mutation is on one chromosome, and if you have it, you have the disorder. So it will, by chance, be given to 50% of all offspring from the, um, the affected individual. Although the inherent inheritance of this disorder is quite simple, it is a complex phenotype. They have difficulty not only learning and expressing language, but also um, in just producing the speech sounds, the verbal 
m fine motor movements that you need to produce speech sounds. It's not a motor disorder in general. Their fine motor skills are fine. It's really about the motor um, and production of speech. They do also have um, problems in comprehending speech and they have bad grammar and many of them go on to have reading disorders. However, what's pretty clear is this is not a general intelligence problem in affected individuals in this family. Many of them have um, pretty normal uh, nonverbal IQs, and it does seem to be, a, uh, and they have really been studied quite carefully to be a problem that's very specific to speech and language. We were able to identify the damaged gene um, in this family by using classic linkage analysis, that's getting genetic markers and tracking them in the family to try to find out which uh, chromosome the gene must lie. We found this area on the long arm of chromosome 7 in 1998. And we were very lucky to identify a second patient who had a, an almost identical, not, in, not a, it was a single case of a boy of about five or six years old. He had a very, very similar speech and language disorder as the members of the KE family, but this child had a translocation breakpoint, and that arrow there points to where the chromosome was broken uh, with between chromosome 7, I think it was chromosome 5 in this child, and that was the key. We could go right towards that breakpoint um, and identify the gene. We were able, after we identified the gene, and I'll tell you more about it in a second, to go through and actually sequence the members of the KE family, and we were able to see that there was a mutation here in the sequence where um, in the normal individual it's a G, but in the affected individual here, one chromosome has a G, the other chromosome has an A, and that is the mutation which gives rise to the disorder. The gene had 17, um, the way it was structured in the genome, it had 17 exons. You can see here the mutation in the KE family, I think, was in exon, one of the exons over here. And this is the translocation breakpoint, which broke the gene in half in that uh, five-year-old boy uh, who had the same speech and language disorder. So we had to then try to understand what does this gene do. It's called FOXP2. And that's because it contains a particular type of sequence called the forkhead box. And the forkhead box is seen in 43 different human uh, genes called Fox genes. And they're divided into different groups based on their similarity. And this gene was called Fox P2. It's the second member of the P subgroup. What this Fox bit does is it binds to DNA. And it forms a, a barrel uh, here. And you can actually see this is, the, this is a three-dimensional structure of the protein. And this uh, amino acid here is the one that was altered in the KE family, which did not allow it to bind to DNA. And genes that produce proteins that bind to DNA are called transcription factors. So here's the FOXP2 gene. It makes an RNA, which makes the protein called FOXP2. And that can go and sit on another gene in the front of that gene and turn it on, activate it, or turn it off, repress it. It turns out that FOXPT does most of its action through repression of other genes, and I'll give you an example. But this is a whole class of um, genes that are very important in how the rest of the genome is regulated uh, in, in the sense that it can alter the amount of RNA made from other genes. It's kind of like a master switch. We don't think this is the gene for speech. This gene has a lot of other different functions, but it is quite an interesting gene that we think is definitely involved in speech. It's very, very conserved between other vertebrate species, but these species lack speech and language, so it obviously has other functions. It turns out, and I'll show you a little evidence later, that this gene has a very important role in vocalizations in other species. So in mice, if we knock this gene out, they don't squeak properly. In songbirds, this gene is incredibly important in the part of their brain which they need to, in order to learn songs from uh, one to another. So we think this gene has had an ancient role in vocalizations throughout the different evolution and in, in humans probably took on the role of helping to develop uh, speech and language. But it is uh, expressed in other parts of the body, like lung, intestines, and heart. So there's a lot of interesting questions one can ask. Do the variants in this gene contribute to more common language-related disorders? 
As I mentioned, specific language impairment is about 5% of the population. The KE family is a very rare form. And we asked the question, does FOXP2 contribute? And it doesn't. We didn't find any examples of association or mutations in FOXP2, which were there in the very common forms of language impairment. But there's a twist to that story, which I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. We wanted to know where is it expressed in the brain, what, where is it important. We wanted to know about its evolution, especially to our most recent ancestors, uh, the primates. And we wanted to understand what some of the downstream targets are, which genes is it turning on and off, because they may be important in other forms of language impairment. And then what happens when you disrupt uh, in a mouse, does this create the squeak one mouse? So it does provide a molecular window. So I mentioned that it is a transcription factor. It will go and bind to other DNA. And on chromosome 7, further down the chromosome, is the gene for contactin-associated protein 2, which I showed you in that schematic, uh, which is important in the connection between brain cells. So we found, or uh, Simon Fisher's group um, in the Gene Center found that FOXP2 inhibited contactin associated protein 2 from being expressed. So it sits down there near its promoter at the beginning of the gene. And actually, when FOXP2 is on, if you overexpress FOXP2, contactin associated protein is turned off. So it's, a, it's sitting on the front of the gene and it's not letting it make RNA. You can actually see that in strips in the brain. If you look at the brain, you can see when FOXP2 is on, contactin-associated protein is off. When FOXP2 is off, contactin-associated protein is on. So they have an alternate pattern in the brain which shows how one is being driven by the other. But what was very interesting for us is we took variants, different genetic variants throughout this gene in contactin-associated protein 2 and asked, were any of those associated with the common forms of language impairment? Were there variants in this FOXP2 regulated gene that could um, uh, make a difference in the more common forms? And the answer was yes. We definitely found a strong association, and this has been replicated in other families. The other thing we did was to see where is FOXP2 expressed in the brain, and it is expressed in multiple areas. I won't go through all the anatomy, but most of these areas are involved in motor uh, functions in the brain the basal ganglia, the substantia nigra, which is involved in Parkinson's disease, the thalamus, the, the cerebellum. These are all important areas uh, in motor planning and sequencing, which may explain some of the motor and verbal dyspraxia that these, these family members who were affected had. The most interesting story about FOXP2 probably came out of looking at its evolution. If you look at the difference between the human and mouse forms, there are only three amino acid changes between human and mouse, which is like 100 million years of evolution. That's, uh, you can see there, there are letters there. So the D goes to an E, and the N and S go to a T and N. But when you look at primates, the chimp, it turns out the chimps are more similar to mice than they are to humans in this gene. And that's quite something, because the chimps have only been um, our recent uh, evolutionary cousins for the last um, uh, six million years. So when it comes to FOXP2 as a protein, the chimpanzee is more similar to the mouse than it is to a human. And we did a lot of studies with a group in Germany where they sequenced lots of humans around these changes, and they can actually use that data to define when did these changes occur in human evolution. And it turns out it's probably about 200,000 years ago and that is compatible with what we know about the emergence of spoken language. So whatever role this gene had in the development of spoken language, it is compatible that the amino acid changes that were seen in the chimp to human line occurred at a time that of recent human uh, spoken language. So that's quite an interesting correlation. It's not causation, but it's certainly compatible for a very important role in this gene in the development of human speech and language. I talked about the animal models. If you knock it out in a mouse, they have a lot of motor problems, but they also can't produce ultrasonic vocalizations. And in songbirds, this gene is very much upregulated in the area that is known to be essential for songbird learning. So to summarize, um, we think that FOXP2 is uh, important in um, 
in, in this very rare form of speech and language disorder in the KE family and several others that have been identified. It does regulate other genes, and one of those contactin-associated protein has now been a, a way of showing that that gene is involved in the more common forms of speech and language impairment and that this gene has got a lot of important roles in mice and vocal learning in songbirds and a very interesting evolutionary system that probably had changes in the most recent years uh, that were in, uh, compatible with human speech and language. And if I have time, I'd like to spend five minutes to tell you what we're doing on developmental dyslexia. So this is a, like language impairment, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to show that a child has a reading um, disability that's specific. It can't be due to uh, just general lower intelligence uh, or any sensory or neurologic deficit. It's about 5% of school children, a major educational and social problem, and males are definitely more frequently affected than females. Again, it's multifactorial. There are genetic components and environmental factors that are involved, but we tried to track, tr track the genetic components using the third method, which is an association study. So association studies are trying to look at the gene level and asking, are there specific variants in the genes which are associated with the disorder? So if you think of different variants here in a gene and you ask how frequent are they in controls, that are people without dyslexia or with dyslexia, you can see these numbers are not significantly different, but this one, variant four, is twice as frequent in dyslexic cases as it is in controls. And that's evidence when you're using a large number in cases in controls that um, that, that variant is associated with dyslexia and for some reason increases the risk for dyslexia. So this is the approach we took with these studies, you can now do this genome-wide. The technology is there to do this with millions of markers across the genome and to get very accurate mapping of where susceptibility variants in genes lie. So we've been mapping this uh, along with others. There's definitely evidence for um, candidate genes on chromosome 6, and I'm going to tell you about the KIAA0319 gene, but you can see that there's other candidates that have been identified using these types of association studies, and I will touch on those at the very end. This is a complex slide, but I think the basic message is that if you look at the area around chromosome 6 where this KIAA0319 gene is, you can line up all the genetic markers across the region here on the x-axis and also on the y-axis, the same markers, and the green mountains are the marker-to-marker associations. That just basically tells you the history of how these markers are associated with each other from the many generations of humans. And really what you really want to understand is how does something like reading disability map onto those mountains. So the red line is uh, single word reading in our families and you can see that there's a very significant association with specific variants at the front end of the KIAA019 uh, gene here with reading um, disability. So it's pretty strong evidence that there's something about those variants that are driving the expression of that gene which have some effect on increasing risk for dyslexia. What do we know about it so far? The variants in this gene are in the promoter region. That's the front end of the gene, the kind of engine of the gene which makes the RNA. And we know that, that what's happened is the variants which increase the risk for dyslexia stop a separate transcription factor from binding. Uh, sorry, they don't stop. They actually create a binding site for another transcription factor that, like FOXP2, represses the expression of that gene. So if you've got that variant, you're probably going to produce less of KIA0319 than those that don't have the variant. We also looked at this variant in the general population because we discovered it in a clinical cohort of dyslexics, but we wanted to understand whether it has um, importance in the general population. So we did an epidemiologic study of over 10,000 children, and we're able to show that these variants are increasing the risk for um, reading problems in the general population. We also looked to see where it's expressed in, in the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum uh, in humans and mice. The most interesting data, though, about its function 
came about from a study with Joe Leturco at the University of Connecticut. And basically, he has a way of shutting down the expression of this gene in the developing brain of rats. And then he asked the question, do these rats produce normal um, cortical uh, migration of neurons? So neurons are usually born in one area here, and they've got to migrate to their final home in the cortex. And you can see that when we knocked down THEM2 and T-TRAP, which are the other two genes in that area of chromosome 6, and you track that with a fluorescent protein, you can see that the neurons are very happily climbing up those radial glial fibers and getting off at the right elevator level of the cortex. However, if you knock down KIAA0319, they don't get on the elevator. They just stay put at the bottom. They don't migrate properly. And you can rescue that by overexpressing the gene. So this was a very important piece of knowledge about the possible function of this gene in dyslexia that they may inhibit um, uh, when it's reduced expression, it may inhibit the migration of neurons to the right level of the cortex. Now, this was very important, one, because this guy, Joe Leturka, was able to do this with other dyslexia candidate genes. And you can see here the normal pattern in the top. And then there's KIA0319, I think, next to it, which is the slide I showed you previously. But two other candidate genes for dyslexia had a very similar finding that they were in inhibiting this normal migration of brain cells to the right level of the cortex. The reason this is interesting, um, not only because it's a convergence of evidence about the possible function, but there was work done by um, uh, Galiberta at Beth Israel Hospital in the 80s where he looked at the brains of dyslexic individuals and many of them had what are called ectopias, that is, small bundles of neurons shown here that are, not, that are kind of in the wrong layer of the cortex. You can see that they're in other parts of this person's brain, they don't have a lot of cells, but in these dyslexics, they do. And this is a rat model when they knocked down um, one of the candidate genes, you see similar ectopias. So there is evidence even in the pathology of brains from individuals with dyslexia that they may have pockets of neurons which didn't migrate properly to the right level of the cortex. So I think this is nice um, story in the sense that you find the genes, you try to understand their function uh, using animal models, and then when you look back at the human pathology, you can actually see that there may be evidence that a very similar thing is going on in humans. So to summarize, um, I think four different dyslexia susceptibility genes have been identified so far. I only talked about the one from my own lab, KIA0319. They all seem to play a role in neuronal migration in the cortex. And this is consistent with the findings by Galiberta in the autopsies of dyslexic brains where he found these abnormalities of migration called ectopias. So we think that KIA, for example, may be important for the adhesion of neurons to those radial glial fibers, which are like an elevator. They're not climbing on. And for that reason, they don't migrate properly. And this, this may then um, influence the processing in the cortex and the ability for individuals to read. So we feel that these studies have provided a biological pathway in neurodevelopment which might provide better understanding and, and hopefully treatments or interventions. I think I'm going to end there. I hope I was able to show you um, some of the evidence that we found in these three disorders. I'd like to end by saying that, of course, DNA is important in the building up of different behaviors. And one can use the studies of disabilities like autism or language impairment to try to use those in studies to understand the genetic variants, but DNA is not determinative. There are many other things that are involved in this process which are going to influence the outcome. And that's every single step of this, as I showed in that first slide, the proteins, the, the cells themselves, the circuitry they make, and how they build the brain, and of course the environmental influence on all of these processes. So I think I can end now, and these are just the acknowledgments of many of my collaborators and the funding for these three projects. Thank you very much.
uh, microphone because it is being recorded. Thank you very much. This is a more logistical question. Will the PowerPoints be available to us? Sure. My arm got really tired. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Clearly, you're studying the genetics. I'm curious if you've collaborated with anybody or if you're working with anybody to look at epidemiology, to look at it, you know, the, um, and some of the environmental effects and how they're yeah. impacting. So, impacting for the, the dyslexia genetics. study, um, we've been collaborating with the Avon Longitudinal Study of Children out of Bristol. It's called ALSPAC. And it, they, they collected um, 10,000 uh, samples from mothers who were pregnant, and then they got the samples from the children and they've been studying them now over, I think, 17 or 18 years. So that's the study we were able to show that those variants were um, important in reading skills uh, in the general population, and now there are people who are taking that data and trying to look at the different environmental influences that they've recorded in those families over time. And if it, one interesting one was, you know, there was a definite correlation between having the variant and the number of books in the family in the family home that would increase. So there are things that they can look at. I mean, some nutritional, some uh, during pregnancy, but there, there's a whole, whole study now that can now go on once you know the gene variants you want to correlate it with. They're doing similar work on autism as well, as far as I understand. Thank you. Thank you. This this all seems very um, complex, um, doing this kind of research. It's, it's fascinating, but, and this is a very simple question. Uh, I, I wonder if, um, how optimistic are you about, and how soon do you see a cure, or are you looking at just treatment at this point? Sure, I, let me give you more of an example from, um, muscular dystrophy. So we identified the gene for muscular dystrophy in 1986 and made some observations at that time that we thought would be important for potential treatments. It's now um, 25 years, 26 years later, and there are now in phase three clinical trials of treatments based on the observations of 25 years ago. So that shows you how long it takes to develop the things into a drug treatment. So sometimes it goes faster. I, have, I know of examples, um, but usually it takes a long time. The thing about these neurodevelopmental disorders that, that I'm optimistic about is the fact that you know, they're not deterministic. The outcome can be different. The identical twins are a very good example. If they were completely deterministic, then 100% of identical twins would have autism, right? The fact that only 60% or 70% have the severe form, another 20% have the less severe form, means that there are things which are influencing the outcome. And you just have to think about treatments like folic acid for spina bifida, a simple supplement to a pregnant mother which could change the outcome, to make, feel optimistic that further knowledge about the things that are influencing these these developmental pathways may provide interventions. We know that in dyslexia, for example, early intervention on phonetics, phonics, and all that is very, very important. We know that because, at least in the UK, they stopped doing it and they got in real trouble and they, they listened to the scientists and reinstituted um, the, the phonetics and phonics into the, into the reading curriculum and that's changed things tremendously. So I do think that there are also just interventions one can make but we hope that there'll be simple treatments. The fact that many of the genes in autism are in brain connections or synapses is also encouraging from the viewpoint that that's where most of the research in pharmaceutical companies is on central nervous system disorders. So there should be potential treatments that might even be on the shelf that one could um, study in autistic kids. And I know that Roche and many other big pharmaceutical companies are starting to do these types of work. Thank you very much for your presentation. I, I'm curious um, how much of the work that you presented represents um, 
I'm thinking about the data. <laughs> We're, we've been thinking a lot about um, people collaborating uh, use with their data and, and where it gets collected and how it's, you know, um, cataloged and so forth. Um, sure. So I'm just wondering if you could Yeah, talk for example, about all the autism data, uh, it, to be part of that big consortium in the Autism Genome Project, everyone had to contribute all their data to a central repository. It was called the Autism Genome Database or something. And we also deposited it at NIH. So anyone can get access um, to the, it's anonymized, but the access is, is there. I think this is just a bigger issue from you as librarians uh, in terms of the general way in which medicine and biology is going to these very large data sets of big collaborative groups. And when you publish in journals, you don't get access to the data. They, you know, they're all nicely put in a little graph. And I think there's a whole movement afoot about how the publishers working with the funders need to have the data either in a cloud or somewhere where it's accessible for the future because you know it's today's algorithms we're using to analyze it. In the future, there may be whole new ways of analyzing the data that we haven't yet discovered or developed. And if the data is sitting in someone's computer in a university, then that's not going to be helpful for the future. So there is, I think, an interest in making sure that when papers are published that someone is taking responsibility to get the actual data into some place where it can be used you know, 20 years from now rather than having to, to email someone to, to get access to it. I was just going to say you're, you're preaching to the converted yes. here, I think. <laughs> Well, but it's interesting about who is going to take responsibility for this, because if you talk to the publishers, some of them, like Elsevier, are taking it quite seriously and are putting a lot of money and in investing in their own kind of repositories and even algorithms. But then you have the funders like NIH and others who are also thinking about it in terms of open access and who's going to hold the data. And they have put a lot of money into central repositories. The, the autism is a good example of where they hold all the data. As far as, um, uh, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh, as far as the funding goes for this, um, for research in neurodevelopmental disorders, given the huge increase in autism diagnoses over the past years, have you seen uh, a corresponding increase in the funding? Yes, I mean, there's been a lot of private funding. So Simon's Foundation, Nancy Laurie Marks Family Foundation, there's just a lot of individuals who, for family reasons, have children that are affected or relatives that are affected that decide that they're going to use their wealth to help um, solve this problem. And they have pulled a lot of scientists in that were never working on autism before. The Simon's Foundation, I think, is a very good example of that, where they've now uh, really funding some of the best minds uh, in the U.S. in particular on this that are working on autism. They just funded a big thing at MIT. So I don't think that the autism field has to worry too much that there isn't enough funding. What we, do, we don't have right now is enough results, and that will be forthcoming. Thank you. I was just curious, you kept mentioning that there's some sort of kind of maybe protective effect of being female against these, and are there any major hypotheses right now or uh, research that stands out in your mind about what causes this protective effect? Well, the thing I can say from the genetic point of view that we'd never found any evidence in any of those disorders for, for a higher frequency of mutations or genes involved on the human X chromosome. That would have been one hypothesis, that this was being driven by the fact that males are more susceptible because they only have one X chromosome. But that is never, I mean, we have found a few genes on the X, but they don't explain this type of preponderance. So I think the pr protective factor that women have is that they're not men. Um, <laughs> there's something about probably testosterone and the brain development that uh, it makes them more susceptible for some reason. We do not understand it. Uh, with all so much of 
this um, apparently being data driven, how much um, does the work have to be done in the classical lab versus, uh, say, sitting in front of a computer analyzing um, the genome that way? I've seen a huge shift in my own lab over the last 15 years from really most individuals doing, spending all their time on the bench to merely spending probably 50% of their time on the computer preparing and analyzing these large data sets and getting ready to do the experiments. Also, there's a lot more core facilities that do the genotyping and sequencing, and now most of the sequencing is outsourced to companies in China. I mean, most of the stuff even at the bench is now being done uh, at a price uh, in a foreign country. So the whole model of the way much of this research is done has changed. Now that's true from the genetic point of view, but when you get into the animal models and the study of individual proteins, that is still pretty much driven by bench scientists. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.